Dr. Clayton Lane. The topic for this video will be rotator cuff purpose and problems. In order to understand the role of the rotator cuff, it's important to understand a little bit about shoulder biomechanics. In order to do that, I think we should look at three everyday examples or analogies for the different types of joint in the human body. To the left here you see a door hinge which is the most constrained of the three examples I have here because it really only moves in one plane as the hinge bends back and forth. Next we have a trailer and hitch. The trailer hitch while it's somewhat constrained in that it mostly bends side to side as we, the truck goes around the corner we know that uh, it can also move a little bit up and down as the trailer goes over a bump in the road therefore it's a little bit less constrained than a door hinge and then finally a golf ball and a golf tee obviously this is very unconstrained the ball can move in any direction these everyday examples are somewhat imperfect analogies for the different joints in the body to the left the hinge is most like the knee which is very constrained and largely moves in one plane of motion. The trailer and hitch is an analogy for the hip which is a deep ball and socket joint and then finally you have the shoulder which we're talking about today which is more like the golf ball and the golf tee and it's extremely unconstrained. Another way of saying that is that the shoulder is the most unstable joint in the body whereas the knee is more stable and constrained. Well, that begs the question, what keeps the ball of the shoulder in the cup or on the cup? First we'll look at the static constraints. These are fairly limited. There's the labrum of the shoulder which surrounds the glenoid or the cup of the shoulder and deepens it by about 50 percent. This acts as a chalk block that prevents the ball of the shoulder from sliding off the edge with uh, low grade forces applied. Next we have the ligaments of the shoulder. Again you can see these are fairly limited and they really only come into play as we'll see later at extremes of range of motion but here they are and these are called glenohumeral ligaments and really those ligaments are just thickenings of the capsule of the shoulder which we see in this diagram here. That brings us to the dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder, which is really the topic of uh, this talk today, because the dynamic stabilizers are the rotator cuff muscles. There are four rotator cuff muscles surrounding the shoulder, the subscapularis, supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. Now, contrary to what many believe, the rotator cuff muscles aren't technically responsible for lifting the shoulder or allowing our arm to to move forward. However, without them, we can't lift our arm. The reason that is is while the deltoid muscle, this large muscle that you see overlying the whole shoulder and the rotator cuff, this large muscle is actually what provides the power to lift the humerus and you can see that in this diagram here. The deltoid pulls on the humerus uh, allowing us to lift the arm. However, you can see the importance of the rotator cuff in this diagram. Here you see the supraspinatus muscle. It actually provides a kind of counterforce to the force of the deltoid lifting the humerus. The supraspinatus muscle pushes down and also compresses the ball into the cup to allow us to lift the shoulder without hinging off of the acromion in the bone you see here. Well, the upside of having the most unstable joint in the body is that we also see the shoulder as the most versatile joint in the body. You can see from this diagram the extreme range of motion that the shoulder can go through and interestingly enough the ball of the shoulder never translates more than one millimeter from the center of the cup through all that range of motion and the reason for that is the rotator cuff muscles and the fine balance that they have uh, in controlling the shoulder. Obviously there's a downside when we require this delicate machinery to transmit excessive forces and uh, activities such as pitching, um, there's potential for injury to those rotator cuff muscles and other. 
our shoulder probably wasn't meant for this type of uh, heavy weightlifting, bodybuilding, and uh, probably not the extreme sports that we do uh, fairly frequently now as well. Also, any minor injuries to the rotator cuff can deteriorate into a big problem. So if just one component of those four muscles uh, gets injured, then you throw off the delicate balance of the shoulder and this leads to further injury. Shoulder pathology is not that easy to define or put our finger on what causes it. And the reason is what I call the cuff pathology continuum. Really there's a, a cycle of pathology that goes on here and you can start anywhere on that cycle. And without getting too much into the details as to what each of one of these is, we can see that uh, if we start here on the cycle with some impingement, which is where the uh, ball of the shoulder is riding up into that acromion that I spoke of earlier, you start to get some pinching. That would obviously lead to bursitis. Bursitis can lead to inflammation of the cuff, which would be tendonitis, and ultimately tearing of the cuff. Then the cuff becomes weak, and as we saw earlier, that allows the ball to slide up more as the deltoid pulls up, leading to more impingement, more bursitis, so on and so forth. Additionally, you can spin off of this cuff pathology continuum and get other conditions like bicep tendonitis, arthritis, labral injury, a frozen shoulder, or even neck pain can result. So in summary, the shoulder is the most versatile and complex joint in the body. Because of the complexity, there are many variables that need to be considered to effectively diagnose and treat shoulder pain. Thank you.